Before we shall continue, I would like to inform you of today's sponsor, Opera GX. Opera GX is a browser application for PC and mobile that is specifically themed around gaming. Now, the reason why this is cool is because on top of the typical browsing you may do, whether it's watching your favorite content creators or searching up random stuff per usual, it also comes with a lot of features that make gamers' lives a lot more easier and convenient. Such as my favorite feature that this browser has to offer, it's the GX control panel. Within this control panel, you can control how many resources Opera GX is actually using on your system. Right here is where you can control how much network bandwidth is actually being used. Essentially, with this feature, you can make sure that your browser isn't taking too much from your internet connection. This is important for online gaming. I mean, you don't want to have lag, do you? Then you have the RAM limiter. With this, you can limit the amount of RAM being used by the browser. This can be very useful for those who need the extra RAM for that sweet, good old performance when gaming. Personally, I keep mine at 4 gigabytes of RAM. Lastly, you can limit the amount of CPU being used on the browser. Again, this can be used to greatly speed up your performance when gaming. I mean, you can't really go wrong with that, am I right? But we're not done here yet. You know what else Opera GX does? It has this sidebar here, which allows you to have access to a variety of social media platforms at a quick and easy convenience. Now I can safely annoy people with my Sonic Unleashed propaganda. Sounds awesome, right? Well, it should, because it is awesome. If you play games often and you want all of the no-brainer convenient features that this browser has to offer, then I highly implore you to go check out the link in the description so you can download Opera GX today. You can also get it on mobile too, so no worries about that, we got your phone covered too. Anyways, thank you for sponsoring today's video, Opera GX. One of the most entertaining gaming franchises that I've ever invested time into is Sonic the Hedgehog. Sure, there's some bad games here, but for every bad game, there's a good game to make up for it. The Sonic franchise has both a positive and a negative connotation when it comes to the phrase, a gift that keeps on giving. However, what's unique about the Sonic franchise is that there's an unlimited amount of discussion about certain aspects of the franchise. There's debates on whether these games are good, voice actors, and funnily enough, still to this day, the eye color of Sonic the Hedgehog himself. Now, most of these discussions result in multiple ways. It could end with both individuals not coming to an agreement, but at the very least an understanding, or you could get into a screaming match while looking like a bunch of morons. But there is one more outcome that is rare, but when it occurs, it results in a learning experience that benefits both sides of the discussion. This is when a discussion results in a satisfying conclusion in which both parties agree with one another. This has actually happened to me recently over the past few months. One of the most divisive Sonic games ever created is Sonic CD. A large and significant amount of fans find Sonic CD to be a jumbled mess of a classic Sonic game that is mediocre at best. Then there's a whole different side of the fanbase that adores Sonic CD and even considers it a great Sonic game. But the most surprising thing about the divide in opinions is that most people cannot even grasp an understanding as to why the other side believes the things that they do. It's almost as polarizing as the Yanny and Laurel debate in which both sides claim up and down that what they are hearing is the right sound. Everyone always had an interesting take on Sonic CD. It's not as universally loved as the other classic Sonic games. I fell on the side of believing this game to be mediocre, and that's because I felt, at least, that this game strayed way too far away from the original classic Sonic formula. To me, this game was very limiting on how fast you could actually go, because the level design was not doing you any favors. There was always a spike in your way, a spring in your way, or a bouncy floor, or whatever else they decide to throw in your way, this game always got on my nerves. This game's level design is a jumbled mess that did not support speed. Sonic CD has always been a mediocre classic Sonic game that had good music. And that's all I could really say about it. Until now. I planned on making this video months ago. Except during the process of studying Sonic CD, I strangely found myself not just liking it, but absolutely loving it. 
In fact, I love this game so much that it's somehow my most played game in 2022 so far, and that's me comparing it to open world games. I have played through this game countless times, even multiple times in one sitting, and I'm still not even close to being bored with this game. How did I go from believing this game was mediocre to a game that has consumed my free time? Well, there's a lot to go over, so make sure to sit down, grab a drink, and relax because today, we're going to be talking about Sonic CD. After the release of Sonic the Hedgehog, Yuji Naka, the original lead programmer of Sonic, had grown a distaste with multiple policies made by corporate over at Sega of Japan, which eventually resulted in him taking multiple team members to the United States to develop Sonic the Hedgehog 2. However, the Sega Genesis add-on that was the Sega CD was lacking a game from the brand's mascot, Sonic the Hedgehog. So this left no one other than Naoto Oshima, who was the original designer of Sonic himself, to direct and make a new Sonic game for the Sega CD. This is how Sonic CD was created. It also explains the difference in design philosophy that Sonic CD had when compared to Sonic the Hedgehog 2. Sonic CD was more focused on using Sonic's physics for exploration, while Sonic 2 used Sonic's physics by creating level design tailored around pushing you forward. Both of which I've come to enjoy in their own respective ways, however I do have a preference, and we'll get to that later. But, all in all, you can really feel the strong personality that Neo Toshima's team brought to Sonic CD, which resulted in a very bold and unique tone and atmosphere that not many other Sonic games have. This game heavily leans into this shonen styled tone, and oh, oh man, it, it is peak fiction. Whenever I think of classic Sonic, I think of Sonic CD. I just felt that this game overall captured the correct spirit and characterization that Sonic should follow. You get to see my first reason as to why in the beginning animated cutscene. It shows Sonic running around free in a large grassy environment until he eventually runs into Little Planet, which is the main setting of the game. This planet appears only once a year for a limited amount of time. However, now, Dr. Robotnik has caught wind of this and has decided to try and take over Little Planet for his own diabolical schemes. What a big fat meanie face. When Sonic notices that Lil Planet has been chained up to a mountain, this puts Sonic in a mood of determination. The cutscene ends with Sonic blasting off to Lil Planet with the intent of putting a stop to Robotnik's terror. This entire sequence shows off Sonic's character so well. It shows the freedom of Sonic's lifestyle, but it also shows how he has determination for defending that freedom. This, to me, is the most important aspect of Sonic's character. Sonic lives with the philosophy of freedom. If anything threatens that philosophy for himself or others, that's when Sonic's heroic nature kicks in. This is something that is true for every interpretation of Sonic, except it's greatly emphasized here in Sonic CD. It even comes with a shonen-esque tone to the character. The shonen tone is so strong to the point where when I think of classic Sonic, I funnily enough picture a shonen-styled Sonic. And it's all because of this one cutscene. This is just cool. This is why I love classic Sonic. What makes it better is this anime slash shonen tone continues throughout the rest of the game in the form of the story, the soundtrack, and the environments of the zones. All of which are great in my opinion. Starting off big with the environments, this entire game is filled to the brim with a unique exaggerated art style. In Palm Tree Panic, you see mountains that reach up to the clouds. In Quartz Quadrant, you see a nice cave with quartz and other crystals spread out everywhere. In Stardust Speedway, you're running on a highway with a beautiful city in the background. These are great environments, and the soundtracks for these stages support the most upbeat action. The cool thing is that these environments, for the most part, are really aesthetically pleasing. And aesthetically pleasing environments are very important to Sonic the Hedgehog. Not because good visuals are good, but rather because it ties back into Sonic's story. Why is that the case? Well, let me give you some context. You see, not many people really think about this, but the classic Sonic games are all about protecting the environment and its inhabitants. Dr. Robotnik, who is the main antagonist, is using the environment for his own benefit by stealing the peaceful creatures and placing his contraptions everywhere. Sonic, who is the protagonist, 
has the goal of protecting the animals and by extension, the environment from the evil schemes of Dr. Robotnik. Pretty cool premise, right? Well, unfortunately, the classic Sonic games never really went too in-depth with this plotline. The idea of Sonic protecting the animals and the environment feels less like a story and more like background context for the game that you're playing in. And look, I'm not critiquing the classic Sonic games, there's nothing inherently wrong about that, but they could always do more. And that's exactly what Sonic CD did. Sonic CD addresses the main purpose of Sonic's journey. In the game, you travel across many zones that take place on Little Planet. Most of these zones are aesthetically pleasing, except unfortunately they have been taken over by Dr. Robotnik. So now the main objective is for Sonic to save the environment, and there are multiple outcomes to this. If you wish to save the zone, you can go back to the past which will reveal what the zone looked like before Dr. Robotnik fully took over. If you destroy all of the generators and Metal Sonic holograms, it will save the future zone from Dr. Robotnik's wrath. This is what we call the good future. The good future shows the environment that Sonic is playing in, except without the effects of Dr. Robotnik taking control. These environments look absolutely beautiful, and the soundtracks for these stages invoke a sense of happiness that no other game can capture. Here, just take a listen. In Quartz Quadrant, it's no longer a mineshaft, and now it has some kind of futuristic domes in the background. In Collision Chaos, upon reaching the good future, you can see a futuristic city replacing the giant forest that used to be in the background. Both of these environments are beautiful, and they're such a great reward for going through the effort of time traveling. Also, side note, I cannot be the only one who gets Dragon Ball vibes from the futuristic city settings, right? Like, I could totally see that being West City. Like, come on guys, seriously? Alright, I'll take my leave. On the flip side, if you do not destroy the generators in the past, you will run into a dystopian reality of the zone you are playing in. The dystopian reality typically has dark skies, enemies everywhere, and a completely destroyed or taken over environment. It doesn't look pretty in the slightest. In a way, it's kind of sad. The zone will even have a new soundtrack which invokes feelings of destruction and intensity. Here's a bit from Quartz Quadrant Bad Future. Sometimes a soundtrack even makes you feel guilty, especially with Palm Tree Panic. In the good future, Palm Tree Panic has such a happy soundtrack with such a beautiful environment. The music even includes children cheering out of happiness, yay! However, in the bad future of Palm Tree Panic, the zone is completely destroyed with all wildlife and plants dead. Then, in the soundtrack, you can hear the cheers of the children becoming corrupted just like the reality that Sonic is living in. Take a listen. Every time I play this stage, I feel guilty, which is why I'm only doing it now for footage of this video. Like, I really caused all of this destruction. I, I gotta be one of the worst human beings ever made. Now, in retrospect, this is a brilliant way of showing the main story of the classic Sonic games. If Sonic doesn't take care of the environment, we get to see a dystopian reality of what once was a peaceful landscape. However, if Sonic does protect the environment, we get to see the positive effects that Sonic has on the environment from putting a stop to Dr. Robotnik's evil schemes. I love this. It feels like Sega fully realized the extent of Sonic's character and world, and the best part about it is that it ties directly back into the gameplay. It's actually brilliant. All of that is what makes Sonic CD so unique and bold. If you play with the Japanese soundtrack. Okay, for some reason, Sega decided to make two separate soundtracks for the game depending on which region you're playing it from. In Japan, Sonic CD got the soundtrack that I've been featuring throughout the video. 
However, there is a much different soundtrack for the US version of the game that gives off much different feelings during the course of playing the game. There's still bangers in the US soundtrack, I especially like tracks such as Palm Tree Panic and Stardust Speedway. The rest of the soundtrack is also pretty good, but in my biased point of view, I feel that the Japanese soundtrack does a much better job. The Japanese soundtrack just felt much more impactful in the sense that the Bad Future tracks gave off exaggerated feelings of great intensity and fear, while the Good Future tracks gave off exaggerated feelings of bliss and happiness. But with the US soundtrack, the Bad Future music doesn't even give me the same strong feelings. When I hear a Bad Future song from the US soundtrack, it, it doesn't strike enough fear into me. And the Good Future tracks don't make me feel like I'm in a utopian reality like how the Japanese soundtrack does. I just feel that the Japanese soundtrack captured the energy of this game a lot better, but I know this is very subjective, so really, it's up to preference. There's no problem with enjoying the US or Japanese soundtrack more. Both serve their own purposes, but let's be honest, Japanese is the correct answer. Anyways, we talked enough about the world and the main objective of Sonic CD. What actually happens during the main course of Sonic CD's storyline? Well, it all begins with Sonic who is on a journey to restore peace back into Lil Planet and put a stop to Dr. Robotnik's plans. That is until he runs into another character. That character is Amy Rose. Amy Rose is your typical damsel in distress that you'll find in so many other works of fiction. Except what sets Amy Rose apart from other damsels is her relationship with Sonic the Hedgehog. Amy Rose shows a strong attraction towards Sonic, however Sonic does not reciprocate those feelings. I mean he's not a total jerk, he'll still go out of his way to save Amy, but he's not sticking around for any of that romance nonsense. This is what made Sonic and Amy's dynamic so unique. Instead of giving a flat character trait of saving damsel for romantic desires, they made the damsel as a way of telling us more about Sonic as a character. Sonic, again, is all about freedom. He has no time for commitment. Like, come on, commitment is for old grandpa loser babies. Sonic is cool, he ain't like that. But I am by no means underestimating Amy Rose's character. Amy Rose has become a fan favorite Sonic character and personally one of my favorites as well. They even made jabs at the damsel in distress trope in Sonic Adventure by creating an entire story centered around breaking out of that social norm. But it's best to leave that for another video. Anyways, after Palm Tree Panic, Sonic with Amy following him from behind, travels to the next zone being Collision Chaos. This is when another character is revealed. Oh boy, it's time to talk about Metal Sonic. At the beginning of Collision Chaos, Metal Sonic grabs Amy like a chad and flies away with her. Now, Sonic CD has another objective. On top of Sonic needing to restore peace back to Lil Planet, he also has to save Amy Rose who has been captured by Metal Sonic. The first antagonist to be a genuine threat to Sonic himself. All of the previous bosses and enemies that Sonic has faced may have been a threat to the player, but narratively, they were only challenging obstacles in Sonic's way. I mean, Sonic's faster than the speed of sound, and speed comes with a lot of power. So now, you have Metal Sonic, who is an antagonist that shares a similar ability of speed. That's how you create a compelling character. That's also not to mention the great design of Metal Sonic. He has the silhouette of Sonic, but his entire design has changed in the sense that he's been completely roboticized. He even has Sonic's determination and attitude to a much more exaggerated degree. He looks 10 times more determined while having a much more threatening presence. Yeah, I'm just gonna say it, this is good character design. Metal Sonic alone is what made me convince my parents when I was young to buy me a copy of Sonic Gems Collection just so I could play Sonic CD. He's that cultivating, which only makes playing through Sonic CD much more exciting. Throughout the rest of the story, Sonic restores more of the zones back to their peaceful natures. Until he eventually reaches Stardust Speedway. This is when the tease Metal Sonic boss finally occurs and it definitely didn't disappoint. Let me put this into perspective for you. Sonic has an enemy who is just as fast as he is. What is the most logical thing to do with that dynamic? Well, it's obviously to make them race. Duh. This has got to be one of my favorite Sonic boss fights of all time, because it's not based around if Sonic can dodge attacks and strike accordingly. 
It's instead about the player's ability to platform and avoid upcoming obstacles. I love this idea so much. The boss is actually testing your abilities to platform now. The thing you have been doing for the entire game up to this point. Something else that's really cool about this boss fight is that it always ends in a close match. When you cross a finish line, Metal Sonic is always less than 4 seconds behind you and you get to watch as he smacks right into the wall where he falls to his death. Such a satisfying relieving end to a boss fight that was hyped up for the entire game. Also, a really nice touch is that it doesn't matter if you are in the good future, you will always hear the Stardust Speedway Bad Future soundtrack. And that song is perfect for this fight. It makes the player feel so determined to win, similarly to how both Sonic and Metal Sonic are in this boss fight. I could keep going on about how this fight is awesome, but I think you guys get the picture. The story ends with Sonic going to Metallic Madness to restore the final part of Lil Planet. Upon defeating Dr. Robotnik, a cutscene plays showing Sonic escaping with Amy from Metallic Madness and to a further extent, Lil Planet. After Sonic drops Amy off to a safe area, he runs up to a mountainside. This is when he sees the chain that is trapping Lil Planet break apart into a thousand pieces. Lil Planet rises up into the sky as it bursts into dust. Then credits roll as a montage of animated clips play in the background. This ending is just... It's so charming. It's such a nice conclusion to wrap up the journey that was Sonic CD. You get a nice, reflective, and relaxing track alongside an animation with an anime-esque tone that this game has carried all throughout. Stuff like this is why storytelling can be very powerful when it comes to Sonic. Storytelling was one of the things that set Sonic apart from Mario, and it's because of moments of payoff like this one right here. Having some kind of story that is charming while playing through the game can greatly help at leaving a nice everlasting impression of the game. Sonic 2 set the precedent, and Sonic CD created a game that was thematically impressive on multiple factors. In my opinion, Sonic CD has the best tone and atmosphere that classic Sonic has to offer. Like, Sonic 3 and Sonic Mania are very charming games, but Sonic CD was so close to that anime Sonic-inspired game that it just works so well. And surprisingly, that's not too big of a hot take to have when it comes to Sonic CD. Since most people generally agree that the soundtrack, tone, art direction, the story are all fantastic aspects of the game, everything I've talked about thus far is not controversial. The controversial part of Sonic CD comes from the gameplay. Oh man, here we go. So, Sonic CD's gameplay is a bit of a mixed bag for a lot of people. As referenced from the beginning of the video, you'll typically find someone either loving Sonic CD, or you'll find someone who believes Sonic CD to be a rather mediocre and confusing experience. Now, all of this can be explained by how the game is designed. Sonic CD is structured similarly to every other classic Sonic game in the sense that you start at the left side of the stage and the objective is to cross the signpost at the right side of the stage. However, Sonic CD is a lot different from the other classic Sonic games because the level design is much larger vertically. The decision to give more verticality to the level design was made to compensate for the amount of exploring that Sonic would be doing in the game. As previously mentioned, the goal of exploration in this game is to go back to the past and find and destroy all of the generators and Metal Sonic hologram placements. If you were to do this in every level, it would result in getting the good ending in every zone. Now, that is just one option to completing this game successfully and obtaining the good ending. Another way is if you decide to get the Time Stones, which you can obtain by completing the special stages. You enter the special stages in the same way as the first Sonic the Hedgehog. You must gather 50 rings and then bring them to the end of the stage, which you will run into a giant ring that acts as a portal to the special stage. Now, with all of that in mind, it's apparent that Sonic CD is a lot more complicated than your average 2D Sonic game. But it doesn't end there. Sonic CD is also littered with a large amount of springs everywhere, random gimmicks, enemies, and spikes. This is the issue most people have with Sonic CD. Unlike Sonic the Hedgehog 2 and in some cases the first Sonic the Hedgehog, 
Sonic CD doesn't promote speed in the slightest. Like, sure, you always have your typical loop-de-loop -loop or downward slope, but it almost always is halted by some inconvenient level design placement like a spring or a spike. Now, don't get me wrong, the idea of exploration is brilliant. I liked in Sonic the Hedgehog 3 because exploring those levels never detracted from the high-speed gameplay. But in Sonic CD, the exploration requires you to drop everything you are doing so you can search every nook and cranny of every single level to find a generator and metal Sonic hologram. That is why I personally do not explore the levels for the generators. It just detracts way too far away from the high speed nature of the other classic Sonic games. I think Sonic CD is best played when going for these special stages. When playing this way, the game is a lot more bearable because you don't have to search up and down these poorly designed levels. You can just play the levels like a normal Sonic game from the left side of the stage to the right side of the stage and have a decent time playing. It's still not great because you still have to deal with the annoyance of the level design, but it's a pretty alright experience for the most part. Now, that's what I would have said a few months ago. But things have changed since then. I was right there with the same belief as a lot of Sonic fans that this game was just a jumbled, mediocre mess of a Sonic game. And I was planning on making a Sonic CD review where I just stated that. But something was just irking me. How can anyone love this game? What about this game is fun? I always like to analyze video games and break down what makes them enjoyable and what makes them not enjoyable. However, with the case of Sonic CD, I just could not bring myself to understand how someone can say that this is a great game. So, before I started making my review on Sonic CD, I decided to hear the other side out. I was going to listen to fans who love Sonic CD. With that said, I made a post on Twitter asking what people loved about Sonic CD. In addition, I asked, what makes the level design good? The responses I got were interesting to say the least. Everyone had different reasons for loving the game, but the most common things I kept seeing is people saying that the exploration was the best part of Sonic CD. And that's nothing out of the ordinary, I've heard the same thing from every other Sonic CD fan. Everyone who loves this game always talks about the exploration. I always ignore it because... What does that even mean? How are you even supposed to explore in this absurd level design? Well, I want to know what exploration really meant. So I went back to replay Sonic CD to see exactly what everyone was talking about. Except this time, I played Sonic CD with a twist. In this playthrough, I was not targeting these special stages. I was going to locate and destroy all of the generators. And on top of that, I was going to play through this game four times in one sitting so I could memorize every single generator location. Admittedly, this seemed like it was going to suck. Especially since I wasn't going to search up where the locations were unless I had zero clue of where to go. So, I found most of the generators and found out how to time travel in every single zone, almost all by myself. Yeah. Now, upon my first playthrough, I was spending most of it exploring these levels, trying to find the generators. After searching extensively through these levels, I found myself to be having a pretty good time. I was actually pleasantly surprised at how much I was enjoying the action of finding everything in these stages. Because there were a lot of times where I had to get really creative on how I can manipulate slopes or springs to reach higher areas. Something that I will go in a bit more detail a little bit later. Now, after the first playthrough, I already felt my opinion of Sonic CD changing. I found myself enjoying the new concept of exploring these levels to great lengths, but I ultimately felt like Sonic CD was still a far inferior experience when compared to the other 2D Sonic games. That was until the second playthrough. Since I played through the game multiple times in one sitting, it meant that I could remember all of the generator locations. And upon my second playthrough, it was like an entirely different experience from the first. I already knew where all the generators were, so now in this playthrough, it was a matter of how I would reach the generators. How will I navigate the level design in a smart and efficient way so I can complete these levels faster? That was my new objective with Sonic CD, and it made me start playing Sonic CD with a new set of eyes. 
I started to appreciate the level design. Like, the level design is genuinely brilliantly made. I'm not going crazy here. I will even say that I prefer Sonic CD over Sonic 2 now. It's not even a competition in my eyes. Yes, I know I sound crazy. I'm not crazy. Let's talk about it. A common critique is that there are lots of obstacles that constantly hold you back. But that's kind of the point. Here is your objective and how you explore in Sonic CD. Your main objective is to manipulate the level design to be in your favor for time travel and navigation for the generators. As to how you go about navigating these levels is completely up to you and there are so many different ways you can go about successfully playing the game. When time traveling, Sonic has to hit a past or future signpost based on where he wants to go, then he has to go fast for a specific amount of time. And at first this was a frustrating feature, but now I understand the brilliance of it. Like the game starts making you actually think like Sonic the Hedgehog. When you have to time travel, you start looking at slopes and springs to see what parts of the level design can help Sonic move the fastest for an extended period of time. You start paying attention to the things around you like, oh hey, there's two springs next to each other, I can use this spot to time travel to the past. Or oh look there, it's a long pathway. I bet if I super peel out, I'll have enough room to time travel. It's all up to the player on how you go about completing the objective. For example, this happened to me while I was recording a recent playthrough. There is a pathway I usually take to travel to the past because it's a fast and easy way of traveling. But, you know, I was a bit stupid and I messed it up. I was a dingus and I lost my past signpost. So what I did is I found another signpost and then proceeded to find a completely different way to go about traveling to the past. Just like that, I innovated and found a different way to tackle the level. And I still completed the level in a fast amount of time. It's like improv. There's just so many locations and alternate ways for you to go about time travel in the levels, and when you start navigating this level design with that mindset, you begin to realize that the once annoying springs that halted you before may just serve an important purpose that you never realized it did. After I learned the level layouts and all the ways to time travel or reach the generators, the level design stopped looking like a jumbled mess. Now, it looks like a playground that has hundreds of opportunities for completing levels. The absolute best part too is that every time I replay this game, I improve my skill in one way or another. And oh man, I am able to complete this game pretty dang fast now. For what was once a slow slog of a game is now my favorite Sonic game to speedrun. How does that even work? I don't know, this, this world is funny sometimes. All I know is that I finally got to play Sonic CD the way it was meant to be played, and now I understand this game on a level that I never thought I would. Look guys, <laughs> There are very few Sonic games that have absorbed me as a player, to the point where nothing else matters. I'm happy to say that Sonic CD is now one of them. Yeah, this video was supposed to come out in June. It's September. Over the past few months, I have played through Sonic CD about four to five times a week, and that is not an exaggeration. Since the game was only really an hour long, it was pretty easy to just sit down and play through it. Especially with how busy I've been, being able to sit down and play Sonic CD before bed has oddly been the most relaxing part of my day for quite a while. Trust me, I know it's strange, like, I, I can already feel the neck beard growing in. I just want to emphasize how much my viewpoint has changed about this game, like, I've really come to love it. I know that not everyone's viewpoint on Sonic CD will change with this video, but if I can get at least one person to play this game with a newfound perspective, I consider it a win in my book. I truly do believe that this game has a lot of great qualities that go unnoticed, and honestly, I think most of it is because of the special stages. Oh yeah, the special stages. You aren't getting off easy. I'm gonna rip you to shreds. Chasing the special stages can be fun in their own right, but I feel like it does more harm than good. I've noticed that special stages have always been the safe option for Sonic CD. When a player goes to play the game, the idea of exploring a 2D Sonic level 
can be daunting. And yes, I get it, it doesn't sound that fun on paper. Especially if you played the Sonic Advance games and the, you're traumatized by the special stages. So the most logical solution is to just choose the special stages because you're already familiar with that structure of gameplay. But all this does is give the players less of a reason to explore these levels and really get to understand them. Why explore when the main objective is to get from point A to point B? What's even the point? So then, players fall into the trap of trying to play Sonic CD as if it was Sonic the Hedgehog 2 or 3. You just hold forward, platform, and occasionally look around for goodies. Trying to play the game like that just does not work. Because to understand how to get from point A to point B in the first place, you have to know how the level is structured so that you know your options of what paths to take and how to avoid obstacles. The level design in this game is very large, not horizontally, but vertically. So the majority of the pathways and fast routes in this game require Sonic to navigate through the verticality of this stage, which is completely different from Sonic 3 and Sonic 2. Now, once you do understand the level layouts and how to use slopes, springs, and whatnot, the special stages then become a fun addition to the game that changes how some playthroughs may go down. But was it really worth it? I don't think so, man. We have a sea of people who believe this game was made by chimps that don't even know what a Sonic is. You know, if the special stages did not exist, it would, in a way, force a lot of players to actually explore these levels. Because come on, man. We all know that we want the good ending in a Sonic game. Also, just to add a side note, while it's fun to gather rings for the special stage, the special stages themselves aren't even that good. In fact, they kind of suck. You have this sprite of Sonic that is running around in a 3D plane, which looks rather appealing. I mean, have you seen some of these backgrounds? They look like something you would see in a dream or something. This one looks like something straight out of Dragon Ball. But these stages all fall apart when you remember that making 16-bit games with a 3D perspective is not that fun. Like, at all. This is a critique that everyone has made and I have to agree with them. The controls in these special stages suck, plain, and simple. Sonic turns so slowly, and he's too fast. Both of these combined with having to destroy UFOs which are the most annoying objects to hit in video game history. Every time you jump towards one you either miss them or they just conveniently fly out of the way. This is bullying, I don't appreciate this. That is why I stick to the generators now, and I encourage anyone who has never tried finding the generators to go and give it a try. It still might not be your thing, but it's a new perspective on a game that may change how you view it. I, for one, absolutely loves the generators, because as anyone who has watched my content over the past year would know, I like games with a lot of skill mastery. I want to get better at games and reach the top of the skill ceiling. Sonic CD is great at simulating that experience. At first, the playthrough may be frustrating, but over time as I played this game more times than I can count, I've become better and now it's a smooth fun ride. This is my most played game on Sonic Origins by such a long shot, and that's sort of unbelievable. I expected my most played game to be Sonic 3 because that game is just phenomenal, but here we are. At the current time of recording, I have about 74 hours in Sonic Origins, and over 50 of those hours were spent on Sonic CD over the past summer. What a great use of time. I just found so much to love about this game over my time of playing it, and there's some aspects that I never thought I would find any enjoyment out of, ever. I mean, this game literally has everything, from creative level design to a remarkable amount of replayability, and it's all topped off with a great atmosphere that supports one of the best soundtracks I've ever heard. The only setback that I can really think of besides the special stages is the amount of content. It only has seven zones, and compared to Sonic 3 and Sonic Mania, that's not a whole lot. But, in a way, I think I like that about Sonic CD. I actually like that the game is only an hour long, because it's just such a great game to pick up when you're trying to relax and not play anything too ambitious. This is the most misunderstood Sonic game ever made. 
And I feel naive for not realizing that sooner. And that's all I have to say for today. Peace out, guys. My channel members are Epic Gaming with George, Reese, Nix, JNXV, EthanK78, Junyan Ring, Sonicman715, ArtrixYZ, Sonic Cub, Thomas Winry, Chip Chip Chop, Scape, The Squeaker Nerd, Super Shacks, Boom, Sonic Extreme, Super Saiyan Sonic. Thank you all for supporting my channel. Love you guys. Make sure to click one of the end card screens right here. Peace out.